Hey there, it's time for the show, the Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. SALT offers cash loans collateralized by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. When you apply for a loan with SALT, there are no income checks, no credit checks, and no origination fees. If you choose to have your loan funded in stablecoin, including USDC, TrueUSD, or PAX, you may not even need a bank account. SALT offers comprehensive insurance for your collateral assets and keeps them locked in deep cold storage, where they are protected by a robust multi-sig process for the duration of your loan. With SALT's online platform or mobile app, you can track the health of your loan or make deposits and payments on the go. You can also pay back as much as you want, whenever you want, and wrap up your loan at any time. There are no prepayment penalties. Once your loan has been paid back, your assets are returned to you. Visit saltlending.com slash Tatiana to sign up for an account and start exploring your options today. saltlending.com slash Tatiana. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tatiana Show. We're taping today from beautiful Nashville, and I'm joined by two of my good friends. We've got Kevin McKernan coming back on the show, and we've also got my co-host, Josh Shigala. Hey, Josh, how are you doing? Howdy-ho, Tatiana. It's just lovely to be back, and I'm really looking forward to this show. So am I. I love when Kevin comes on. We're going to hear about all this gossip in the cannabis industry, the intrigue, and, and the benefits of blockchain in terms of uh, helping solve some of these problems. So before we get started, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to Salt Lending. Make sure if you guys want to hedge your cryptos, you can go over to Salt, check out what they've got on offer. And of course, our good friends at Voltoro, who, wow, look at that. We have the CEO of Voltoro here on the Tatiana Show. So <laughs> thank you so much, Josh. Um, you guys no have- worries. You guys have uh, the new Vault token going on, which is for already existing users to kind of benefit them and new people can sign up. They get all these benefits. So where do people go to yeah. sign up for that? Uh, they just go to voltoro.com. So that's Vault as in a gold, Vault, V-A-U-L-T, and Oro, which is the Spanish word for gold, O-R-O. Ole! <laughs> Ole! <laughs> Voltoro, yeah. Um, I love it. Cool. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, Kevin. It's great to have you back on with us today. Thanks for having me again, folks. Um, love hearing about salt as well. I did meet some of the folks with salt out in uh, Aspen one time, so I, I like what they're doing. It's interesting to see loaning happening in the, in the crypto space. I agree. Yes, very cool. It's a good team over there. And I like that they're in Colorado. Sometimes, I don't know, you kind of want to work with the U.S. company if they're taking possession of your money. <laughs> Anywho, cool. So, Kevin, you haven't been on in a while. Why don't you give people a little background on your work and kind of how you got into the cannabis space? Oh, okay. That's a long, I won't torture a bit, but um, in 2011, we started uh, Medicinal Genomics, which is a company that does cannabis genetics. Um, and that includes looking at a lot of the pathogens that are on the plant. Uh, so every state that legalizes this um, mandates some level of microbial safety testing, and it's different in every single state. Um, but they're looking for things like Aspergillus and E. coli, so we do that. But we also sequence a lot of people's cannabis uh, genomes, and there's a couple different reasons to do this. You, you can learn a lot about the plant, but there's also a bunch of like plant patents that are now racing their way into the cannabis industry, a little bit controversially, I would say. And that's kind of created a bit of a mess in the industry in that uh, people have been trying to honeypot data on the cannabis plant, and some of those honeypots have gone a little sour, as one might expect in the uh, coming from the crypto space. What, uh, what do you mean by honeypot? Yeah, oh, tell us about this. Oh, sorry. I guess I probably stole that phrase from uh, Andreas, I guess. But uh, it's a centralized database um, that someone can run off with, or it can get hacked. And there's evidence that the, one of the ones in the cannabis industry, uh, both things have occurred. It's a bit... It, uh, it didn't have very good security. It, it was barfing out its admin password quite frequently. And uh, it also, the, the owners of the company decided to pivot the company and, and uh, compete with their customers, which uh, kind of inflamed everybody. But uh, this is all public information. So I'm not going to be doing any slander here. You can go ahead and the audience wants to go ahead and Google. I think you'll probably find an interesting article in High Times on this called uh, Phylos. And I think it's written by a gentleman named Dick Fitz. Uh, who was an employee there, decided to run like hell when he figured out that the whole thing was a, was a scam. But uh, yeah, so they, uh, what's been going on is people have been offering to sequence people's cannabis plants and put the data public to prevent other people from getting patents on, on cannabis plants. And this company in particular 
uh, did this probably to the highest degree where they got thousands of people to submit their cannabis samples. Uh, they claimed they were going to sequence them and put them public, but they never really followed through on the last bit that we're putting it public. They put some stuff public, but like two years late. Um, and then they also did this beautiful thing where they opened up a nonprofit entity uh, that was going to ensure everything was kosher. Uh, and uh, that didn't work out either. So um, I have to say it was an A-level scam. They had a really good cover on this. They got into the New York Times. They had great marketing. Everybody thought they were legit because of the press that they pulled off uh, and the nonprofit they had that was going to be the angel making sure everyone was honest. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they ended up turning on all their customers, claiming they're going to file patents on the material people submitted to them and compete with them. And this created a massive controversy in the industry. Um, but I think the silver lining of it all is it, it reminded everybody that you should probably have some decentralization in these databases uh, and not trust any one entity with owning all of the data. Otherwise, this is what you can expose yourself to. Um, so that happened in the last year, which made it for a very interesting, uh, interesting cannabis year. Um, but I'm thankful that it's, it's, it's kind of pointing a little bit more um, emphasis on watch out for honeypots, these collections of data that, that claim to be your savior, but are in fact uh, vulnerabilities for all of the data getting uh, picked up and ending up being used against you. Yeah, it's, re it's really interesting because I'm used to honeypots being like, you know, a Bitcoin wallet or crypto wallets where, you know, there is sort of defined by money, by value, but you're spot on. I mean, data is more valuable than oil as they say nowadays and um and really if you have these large silos of very very rare data uh that that is very very uh expensive to collect and it gets either hacked or basically stolen like this company has uh by not following through with their their promise yeah yeah it really is a honeypot and i never thought of it like that so we we were quite vocal about calling this out. And I think there was, there was a bit of an immune reaction that happened. Everyone just thought, hey, you're their competitor. You've got some sour grapes and we're not listening to you. Uh, but we were pointing out all along that, look, the data is not going public. You can look in all the places they claim they're going to put it and it's not there or it's taking at least two years to get there. And that's not going to help you from any IP standpoint. But most patents are 18 month publication cycles, right? So if, you, if someone's hoarding the data for years, they're really not your public protector by, um, they really should get that stuff public the day it's sequenced so that you have earliest priority dates. Uh, what we've been doing is making sure those priority dates are immutable. Uh, so when we sequence for somebody, we hash the sequence information with their name and any other meta information they want to give us about the plan. We'll take that file, put it public, take a hash of it, spend it into the op return of either Bitcoin or, um, or Dash, and now they have a hash in a timestamp that we can never go back and change. Uh, the problem people are recognizing with this other group's database is that they had really bad op security. They their their admin password will occasionally burp up on HTTP and it just show you all of their admin credentials, which is kind of hilarious in itself because the the password names were were like autoflower or leal and forgery and and like names that were didn't didn't help their case when they tried to claim they weren't doing this. But uh, the fact that we have those timestamps there means if we go away or get dissolved or get bought by your enemy, you still have your data and you can still prove the timestamp that uh, it existed. The problem we're having with this other database that was very centralized is, is they can edit it and they've, and they've been some evidence that they have been editing it. Uh, where people have submitted samples and they've kind of moved around in, in what they call the galaxy and um, people were also the people who submitted it were able to edit them, which is a real nightmare because when you're trying to present the here how all these strains are related and this is this is an, a really important ip topic uh if someone can go in and edit their material after they've submitted it it kind of creates this chaos engine of uh it's almost like a github problem like conversion control uh so what tends to happen is people will say will submit their samples say hey look i, I thought i had blue dream and and my name's on it but it doesn't show up near the blue dream cluster that's kind of embarrassing i should rename that to what it is <laughs> right uh and so all this kind of uh customer editing of the data means the data is constantly in flux and you never really know what the nomenclature of things are. Uh, likewise, if their admin passwords ending up on, uh, on people's websites, well then, you know, the customers are doubly screwed in that case because not only is their data not public and protecting them, but it's occasionally giving the admin password to random strangers that come along that can go and get it all. So they, uh, it, it was a classic case of when things get centralized, you get operational risks uh, and uh, you, you, know, you need some of these tools 
that de-risk the, the people who are generating the data from actually take, you know, picking it up and running off of it. Uh, but yeah, if you want a good read, like go onto the Instagram threads on for this company and, and you'll see just nothing but uh, vitriol and hatred for what they've done, um, you know, really so. But the other, I think, silver lining in it, which I think a lot of people in the crypto space love to talk about, uh, we're actually seeing um, come forth, which is that community policing can work. Uh, I think these people, they, they were on record saying their revenues were like 1.8 million. Uh, I think they're zero now uh, because everyone has just picked up their business and ran from these people because of uh, what's going on. And it happened in a blink, like literally like over a weekend, there was just mobs of people on the internet uh, yelling about these folks and even boycotting um, multiple different uh, large corporations in the industry and conferences in the industry saying we're never going to attend if you let these people in the door um, and they've this, this kind of mob has successfully made many large companies who were defending them initially when this happened turn on the on this company and basically kick them to the curb uh, so it's yeah this, kind of a beautiful thing to see this is the uh, the perfect use case or example of philosophy based around free markets and uh, businesses, right? So if a business is acting or a bad actor, you will have uh, the, the, sh the users basically openly complaining. Whereas if the state becomes a bad actor or a judge or anyone else, there's nothing really you can do about it. They keep their job and they keep their... So I, I, love, I love that sort of side of, of uh, the internet and free markets. Although you do get false positives, of course you get... Um, you know, competitors complaining about each other and stuff like that. But uh, I do like the fact that you can have these open things. One question I wanted to ask you, Kevin, was what, what are you guys doing differently then? You said you were hashing the information to a blockchain, but that's not really uh, very useful either because if you disappeared, all the data, you know, the hashes don't really uh, make much yeah, sense to anyone. You're, right. you're, you're dead on. Yeah, the hashes are unidirectional. You cannot go backwards from the hash to the sequence. And in many cases, that's okay and actually preferred. Some people want to prove their data existed at a certain time point, but they don't want to necessarily give the data away. Yeah. Um, so there's some utility there. Oh, every time we sequence with somebody, we they have an option to either keep the data public or private. Uh, and if they put it as, as public, it goes up on our website and Canopedia the day that the, the sequence is generated. So that's available for anyone to download, including the client. And we highly recommend the client downloads it in case our ISP or we get, you know, we're in the cannabis industry, right? We could get shut down for, for a variety of internet, you know, uh, Nazism, if you will. Um, so it's important that they download their own data. But the important thing in having that hash in the blockchain is the people who are in control of the timestamps aren't us. Uh, we shouldn't have that kind of power that we could go and edit people's timestamps because someone could come and pay us to start changing priority dates for other people's patents. And, and uh, we don't want to get, in, get involved in that game. And it's better from us from a liability standpoint that we don't become the people who house all this data. I mean, uh, there's all this talk about class action lawsuits now against this company because of what they've done. And if we were to simply repeat what they did not intentionally, we would have a huge liability on our hands. So we really don't want to own the data. We want to give it to the clients that have it, uh, make sure that they download it, but make sure the timestamp is on a database that neither the client or we can necessarily refute, change, or edit. Are you guys the only ones doing this, um, this type of thing while locking into a blockchain? Like, is anybody else using blockchain tech for this? Oh, there's, doing a couple other, uh, there's a couple other fast followers that are copying this business model now that I think, I think a company actually went public on this idea in Canada. Um, Cause in Canada, you can pretty much bring like a ham sandwich public right now. It's got cannabis in it. Um, and uh, I think, so there's probably like one or two that are now starting to, to, um, uh, to plug into this, but we've not seen them generate any sequence data. It's, these look like they're, they're um, concept companies that are kind of selling on the hype of blockchain and cannabis, which is pretty easy to do these days. Uh, but there's not, I, I have not seen any other competitor other than this one that had the honeypot that was a really serious contender that actually was sequencing data. And, and they were sequencing stuff. They were just, um, they were basically just harvesting it before they put it public, which took them two years to harvest every time. So um, so we knew that they were actually legitimately sequencing, although that we have some concerns over the quality of what they were what they were putting public. We think they were actually only putting a smidgen of the data public and, and probably retaining the rest. That's a bit conspiratorial, but it's, it's what it, it's what it looks like from their presentations to investors. Um, so they so were what are they doing now? There. 
Uh, what well, are they going to do? What, do they want to sell it? Do they want to sell the data? What, what, what's so the point they, of Now they want to pivot, and they're claiming they want to use all that data to become breeders um, so that they can compete with the customers that gave them all the data. Um, they now want to get in the business of uh, building a nursery and, and cloning plants and trying to design plants that have like powdery mildew resistance and which are all like laudable goals. Like everybody wants that and everyone's free to go and grow this plant. I don't have any, I don't have any issue with them pivoting. A lot of startups pivot. Uh, it's more of the manner in which they did this where they sold everybody on, we're going to save you from Monsanto when in reality their, their premeditated intention and in all the business plans was to actually turn around and screw the customer in the end and compete with them. Um, and that's what was, I think, so frightening that came out is they had business plans circulating, demonstrating this was all orchestrated since like 2015. Um, so it was, uh, I, I could forgive them if they're like, look, we ran out of money and we just need to pick a more fruitful business model that includes touching the plant. So we're going to go in that direction. I, you know, totally understand that. I've been in many startups that have to pivot. Uh, it's more the it's more the the way that you manage the, your customers and and if you suddenly are, if you're using their data to and you know willingly that you're ultimately going to turn on them and compete with them that's a little bit dirty, and I think that's what really got them in trouble is everyone saw that premeditated plan and was like this is absolute uh, insanity and we have to we have to boycott these people. Wow, so it's been a while that you've been in the cannabis industry and you guys have Canamed coming up like. Can you give us a little breakdown of what you think that industry is looking like now? Obviously, everybody's always talking about what's growing. Um, do you think it's overhyped? Do you think that this is something that governments are going to crack down on because they seem to be moving in the direction of accepting it? Uh, so keen to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I, I think it is underhyped, actually. And I mean, there's certainly a lot of um, very high valuations on publicly traded cannabis stocks. Um, and some of those are getting a little bit more rational now that you know, Wall Street's kind of demanding to make some profits. And a couple of them are starting to turn some profits, which is interesting. Um, CanMed really tries to cover the, the entire spectrum, which is becoming harder and harder because there's um, so many new angles coming in. So uh, this year, CanMed is going to have some presenters talking about people expressing cannabinoids in yeast. They've now got the whole pathway cloned into yeast. Uh, so you can brew cannabinoids now, and they even put it in, in S. cervicii, which is a brewer's yeast. Um, and I'm gonna bet that yeast makes its way through every college campus in the next 10 years, uh, because it's, uh, it's very hard to contain a yeast strain. It's very easy to take a stab of it out of a, out of a lab. And, and Wait, what does that mean? What's a yeast strain? Uh, yeast strain. So when you brew beer, uh, you, pr most people are using Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a yeast strain that, that ferments uh, you know, sugars into alcohol. Well, this one ferments sugars into cannabinoids. Uh, and, uh, wow, and so that's awesome. It's very cool. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, I don't know that it's yet uh, totally efficient. Uh, like in terms of outdoor growing cannabinoids, you probably aren't going to beat CBD grown outdoors or THC grown outdoors, but all the other rare cannabinoids that we lost through prohibition are probably going to get rescued through this, through a system like this. And that the, they demonstrated, this is Kiesling's lab, a very talented uh, synthetic genomics laboratory out in, I think, Berkeley area, but uh, they, uh, they also demonstrated they could feed it different carbon sources and get it to make combinatorial, like a combinatorial library of cannabinoids we've never seen before. So that, that's kind of pharma's uh, wet dream. Um, so I suspect they'll get bought by pharma in the next couple of years. But um, and everyone's you know freaks out that ah it's going to kill growing plants. It's not. It's it's not a zero sum game, right? This is just going to deliver highly purified, probably single compound cannabinoids to pharma. That um, that pharma that's the only way they operate through the FDA is one compound at a time. Um, I don't think it's going to kill the plants because no one's going to roll up a joint of yeast and smoke it. And ha you know, half the cannabis market is flour, so I don't think that's going away. And then there's uh, there are other people that are that are like genetically modifying the plant, which everyone has their you know, radar up for. But um, there are going to be efficiency gains that way. It's just crazy to think it's not going to happen now that we have these better genome references. Um, and then there are other folks that are just doing conventional breeding on it as well. And there's a lot of physicians there talking about all the different diseases that they can hit. Um, there is a, a keynote there from Rafael Machulam. This is the guy who um, discovered THC in 1964. Um, and uh, very recently, um, he has discovered how to stabilize a particular form of the cannabinoids. Uh, so the plant makes these things so they're non-psychoactive out of the gate. So THC and CBD, everyone knows it's about, but the way the plant actually makes them is in the acid form and they're labeled THCA and CBDA. So the plant actually doesn't make anything psychoactive. It's only when you heat THCA does it turn into THC. Uh, so it's, it's a pyrolytic thing, right? 
Uh, well, the problem with both those compounds that have acids on them is they're not very stable. And, and so if you make compounds like that and you put them on the shelf, over time they're going to degrade into psychoactive activity or compounds. So they've, been, they've had a really hard time studying THCA and CBDA because when you give it to somebody, their body partly degrades it as well. Uh, so you never get a clean trial on how well that drug's working without THC popping its head up and haunting you a little bit. Uh, well, this guy, this gentleman's figured out how to solve that problem. He's going to be presenting on that as, as his keynote. Um, and that opens up some really large markets because uh, CBDA is actually five times more potent as a COX-2 inhibitor for pain. And, and a lot of use for CBD right now is pain. Uh, so this looks like a stronger, you know, painkiller that's coming down the pipe that'll get presented. Uh, and there'll be a handful of cannabis uh, genomic studies. I, I'm going to be presenting on the Jamaican line stuff that Dash funded. So uh, that should be that should be fun. Amazing. My sister, uh, unfortunately, had a brain tumor. And um, yeah, and the, you know, of course, she was on a lot of, yeah, yeah, it was really hard. It was hard on everyone because she was pregnant at the time as well. So she couldn't, <gasps> oh, yeah. God. Yeah, so that a lot of the options fell away for like, hardcore med medicines because she had a you know yeah there's a a one a baby inside and uh yeah so it, cbd was a really good option to deal with the pain of having these massive headaches and it, it, if if you know uh 10 was the pain level of giving birth to uh triplets then uh she was said she sort of had normal pain sort of around eight nine uh, from this headache and uh, yeah, the CBD brought it down to like four or three. So wow. it was a really immense move. And the trouble was in Australia, it's still illegal. So she had to get it to, you know, in oh, it's ways. criminal. It's absolutely criminal. That they can't get it to folks like that. And, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if people were giving her shit about, Oh, what about the babies? Uh, you know, and, and it's harmless, but everyone has this image of cannabinoids, like disrupting the youth brain. Um, and it's absolute, it's bollocks. There's nothing behind those claims. In fact, uh, almost everything we're seeing today, and it shows neurogenesis. So this is actually healthy for, for brain development. Um, so I'm so sorry to hear that. Did, did she, so she, she managed to give birth to triplets through all this, huh? <laughs> no, no, it was just one baby, but the, just <sighs> the pain, the pain to sort of uh, try to figure out the pain. It was just this oh, really wow. crazy pain, but uh, but yeah, she's uh, she's given birth and it's uh, it's shrunk a lot. Uh, you know, her face has gone back to normal because it was sort of pressing on all sorts of things. So um, I think uh, she's on. You know, she's been taking the CBD and uh, it's, this thing's shrinking. So uh, it's juicing a lot as well and uh, earthing good. herself. Juicing, a lot juicing gets pregnant. you the acid forms, and those are really important for glioblastomas. Um, there is, I will point people to. There's a couple CanMed talks where physicians have been doing this. They've been looking at glioblastoma, and they have these wonderful like MRI images of like massive tumors in the brain. They give them a cocktail of four cannabinoids. It's usually THC, THCA, CBD, CBDA, the four that we've been talking about, and like in under six months, these things disappear. Wow. Uh, it's absolutely remarkable. Now, these are all anecdotes, and I'm sure it differs case to case. It's not a, it's not a panacea, but there are certain mm -hmm. glios out there that are hyper-responsive to these things, and we don't understand why. Uh, so I really hope, hope for the best. It's good to hear that things are, sh are shrinking, but certainly um, Deb Kimless, um, Google uh, Deb Kimless CanMed, and you'll see a talk that she gave um, getting rid of a glio. Uh, there's also, a, she, she presented, I think, three different glios that she got rid of. And then there was also some work from there from Bonnie Goldstein and uh, Maura, Mara Gordon. All three of them have erased various different um, tumors with cannabinoids. And, and this isn't just one off. They have long lists of patients that um, are going through this. My, my father just actually passed and he was fighting stage four prostate cancer for four years. Oh. And Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, he, he would not have made it for years without um, the bone. These bone mets are incredibly painful, but we had his pain under control, probably down around a one or two for all these years. Um, and he was a bit of a, like Dana Farber was just stunned. They don't see people like this that aren't on morphine drips. Uh, and uh, he managed to get through just with cocktails of, of cannabinoids. We always went with more than one because we just don't understand enough of what's going on. And the, and the success cases all seem to have um, you know, a, a, a potpourri, if you will, of different cannabinoids. That's wild. So do you think that that's the future of cancer cures? I mean, and is there a pushback uh, from like the more traditional pharmaceutical industry at this point? Huge. There's an enormous pushback. And unfortunately, 
even today, these are considered last option type of approaches. Like the conventional Western medicine. Um, I mean, I was just uh, getting a you know yearly checkup yesterday with you know there's a new medical student that was in training and and she was uh, straight out of I think Tufts. Um, and I asked her, you know, are they training you guys on the endocannabinoid system yet? And she's like, no, they're not. It's not in any of the books. And a lot of that is due to the fact that the people who subsidize the book writing are usually the drug manufacturers who are trying to make sure that their drug pathway is properly taught in medical school. And there isn't an owner of the cannabinoids like that that is lobbying to the AMA to get the endocannabinoid system described in medical school. And so it's just not taught. So um, many of the, the, the cancer centers just don't know anything about this. Um, they're fairly open and responsive because now they've seen so many patients come through that report that they don't need to get on opiates with this and they can manage their pain with cannabinoids that Dana Farber was very open with us saying, go for it. We don't care if you do it. We'll, we'll keep track of it, but you know, we, can't, we can't prescribe it or administer it here, but we, we support you all along um, using these. Um, but we do need that to change because I really do think they should be the first line of defense in cancer because they're non-toxic. And, and it's very rare in cancer that you have drugs most of the drugs my father got, the symptoms on the label mimicked the disease progression. Like, okay, this drug is going to give you pain, nausea, and vomiting. I'm like, well, that's what the cancer's doing. How are we going to know whether it's working or not? You just have to trust us. Uh, and that's a really horrible place to put a patient because when the symptoms escalate, they're mentally tortured, not knowing is the disease advancing or is this just a side effect of the treatment they're giving me? Um, the cannabinoids uh, don't do that. The cannabinoids, uh, they get rid of pain and nausea and you, you feel great. Um, and so I would encourage everyone uh, to, to pay close attention to, um, to that as an option and not necessarily take it as a West versus East thing and go all one way. Because sometimes I, I do think that can be a little, um, bit, a little bit cultish against science. I think there is things that, that Western medicine offers uh, in this fight, but uh, they're just not informed on the cannabinoid side. So you have to, you may have to blend, uh, you know, a few of the methods. So, I mean, that's at least what we did with their father. We weren't willing to just completely throw in the towel on Western medicine. They have great radiology and scanning and, and a host of other technologies that can help in cancer. That's so true. Is this something that people are still getting persecuted for? Do you see doctors getting in trouble for going down this route or has that sort of been, you know, has that sort of subsided in the U S at least? So the doctors have, I think, a First Amendment right to write recommendations. Um, they can't write prescriptions. Um, there are some that uh, have their hands tied if they're in large hospitals that have federal funding. So um, there's a great presentation from um, John Gatanis from, from Camden. You may have been to that, that Camden, um, Tatiana. I think back at one of those ones at Harvard Med School. But he, he's a... He's a, a um, uh, an epileptologist and a, a child neurologist at Tufts, and he's stuck in this position where uh, obviously all the kids, uh, are, not all of them, but a lot of cannabinoids, uh, because there's been so much success with CBD, uh, with Charlotte's Web and that whole story. Uh, and so he gets stuck in the scenario where the, the, the children need to come into the hospital and be admitted sometimes. They're on cannabinoids. They need their next dose, and he has to tell them to, uh, and take it and, and don't tell anyone that I told you to do it and come back in because they literally can't administer these things on property. Um, and they oftentimes don't even want to hear about the use. And that puts the doctor in a really tough spot because they do need to know about the cannabinoid usage because they have an impact on the liver metabolism of all the other drugs they're on. Um, so this don't ask, don't tell thing and putting your head in the sand really can run you into a lot of polypharmacy problems where um, you know drug levels of one uh, anti-leptic drug can skyrocket on you if you put them on cannabinoids because they slow down the metabolism of these, of these other drugs. Clobazam is one that's, that's come up and is known. So he gives a really compelling uh, video. If anyone has time, give that, um, that one. It's, it's from John Gatanis. Give that one a look. It's, uh, he kind of walks through all this legal um, you know, double jeopardy people are in uh, trying to deal with this. So it's not gone. The prohibition is still there. And even the legalization, I'd argue, is, is, is an incredibly chronified uh, crony capitalism legalization that's going on. It's all limited licensure state to state. They hand out only a couple licenses in some states. Those become very politically sought after, and you find out the people who get the licenses had ties to particular politicians, and there's some money that's gone that's exchanged hands, and no one ever is held liable for these things. So it's it's not a free market. Uh, yes, it's 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 better than than, than prohibition uh, and threats of violence on people for doing this, but the manner in which it's getting legalized is is greasing a tremendous amount of people in the political class 
I mean, John, John Boner himself is like on the board of, uh, of cannabis companies now, as is Mitch McConnell. Um, these people were, were adamantly putting people in jail five years ago. Wow. Medical people or, or just regular drug people? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. And as to, I haven't itemized the, the types of people they put in jail, but oftentimes, yeah, they're medical people that get, you know, they get sentences for trying to use this for cancer. Um, and it's still happening. It's go, certainly it's going down and we are hearing cases of, of states you know, expunging people's records, which I think is a great thing. And they should, I think they should honestly do that first before they let anyone profit off of the, off the industry is all the people they threw in jail, they should deal with immediately. Uh, but that's not what's happening is they still have people in jail like Ross and others while they are profiting um, to no end on, on building a cannabis industry, both, both the pol political class and of course, you know, many, many individuals in the, in the field. So uh, it's, it's really a shame that it's, it's, it's turned into, um, uh, you know, such a, a disgusting grass for the ring of power, if you will. Wow. What, what about research in other countries? I remember when I went to Canamed, uh, they seemed to be really ahead of the curve in Israel. And it seemed like sometimes we were even subsidizing other countries' research, but we weren't allowed to do it in, in our country. Is that still the same? That's still the case, yeah. Yeah, there are, um, that's interesting. So Rafi Matulam is from Israel, and uh, this might be his last trip out here because it's, uh, he's of the age where those trips from Israel to Pasadena are kind of tiring. Yeah, he, he was initially funded by the NIH for a, a large period of time. I don't know if he still is, but there, there are, you know, research groups that are getting funded through either the NIH or NIAID or um, I would say the National Institute for Drug Abuse, which is NIDA. They fund a, a lot of um, cannabinoid research. The problem that I see with a lot of that research is it is state-based research, so it comes with all of the, um, uh, all the concerns you might have over the liability the state never holds. Um, and, and the fact that NIDA is the Institute for Drug Abuse. It's a scientific institution that has a bias in its name. Uh, they should also have the National Institute of Drug Benefits, maybe. And they might not just be out there hunting for the harm. This agency specifically funds people to look for harm. And they have created the vast majority of the literature that implies cannabis is harmful. And they're the reason why it's probably been prohibited as long as it has, because they're not funding any investigation into the benefits. So, I mean, that, that's, that, that I find to be very ironic. When you look at like state-funded science, you shouldn't have an institution that, that looks for drug, that is biased like that. The title of the institution is we're out to look for one angle of the story and we're not going to look at the other, <laughs> right? It, it should just be National Institutes of Drugs, maybe. Uh, and, and hopefully people there look at both benefits and harm. But uh, they were funded in a way that specifically, I think, very Nixon-like mandate, which is go tell us and investigate how drugs are horrible so we can continue this prohibition and put people in jail and turn it into a, a political division point, if you will. That's wild. What's your main focus now moving forward uh, for, for Kevin McKernan? So we have been, um, well, we've been flooded with um, sequencing requests ever since this honeypot thing blew up. So that's, that's all, all, all fantastic. But the other thing we're trying to do in light of this is further decentralize the marketplace. Uh, and we want to sell the picks and shovels uh, in the decentralization event, if you will. If, uh, it's almost, uh, maybe it's analogous to, to Bitcoin mining, where the mining hardware people uh, seem to do very well in the Bitcoin space because they're selling some of the tools of decentralization. So uh, we're now building kits that allow people to do a lot of this testing locally and keep the data in their own hands and they never even need to send it to us. We think that's the answer to all of this is don't let the honeypots begin in the first place. Sell the pigs and shovels so everybody can, can do their own genomes and keep it all private. The only reason why people are sending it into labs like ours and maybe this other companies is because sequencing traditionally has been extraordinarily expensive. And so it ends up centralizing because the sequencers can be $300,000 to a million dollars. And not everyone's going to pop one of those into their grow and, and just to sequence a couple genomes. They want to ride on the amortization of centralized labs to um, not have to pay for the machine. So we're building tools with a lot of the providers that are going to enable academic universities to get in the game. Right now, the farm bill that legalized hemp in 2018 means the academic universities can start studying it. They couldn't do this before because they would, it would threaten their federal um, funding. Uh, but now that hemp's legal, they can. So anyone can now go to their university nearby and say, hey, can you sequence my plant? And the university is probably going to say, we'd love to. We just don't have the picks and shovels to do it. And we want to be the people that provide those. So... Uh, so we're making more tools um, like that. 
um, a lot of thanks I have to throw out to Dash because Dash really snowballed a transformation in the industry that's going to allow this decentralization. By they, they funded us a, um, a little bit over a year ago to sequence um, a type two plant, a cannabis plant that makes both THC and CBD, and to put it all public. And that has created a huge uh, boon in the industry because now we finally have a almost a, a human quality reference for the cannabis gene that we haven't had a really good one, right? We tried to sequence in 2011 and we put a public, but it was a bit of a mess. It was, the technology just couldn't deal with the, the repetitive content of the plant. So um, now that we have a, a really gold standard reference out there, we've seen like three or four other uh, other groups put their data public as well to chip in. We've, that since caught the attention of a variety of other players in the field that want to contribute to this project. And we've gotten New England Bio Labs has come in and contributed 40 genomes worth of sequencing and, and Pac Bio has, has been generous with their help as well getting, uh, they, they funded a structural variation project, which means we're looking at big chunks of chromosomes that are getting deleted or inserted when you do reading. This tends to happen a lot in plants, and we didn't know to what extent it happened in cannabis until now. They, they funded a sequencing of, a, of a, a trio of a mother, father, and offspring to really exceptional quality so that we could see this and see what's going on. So we now have these wonderful genetic resources we never had before, which is um, now spiraling more industries wanting to get in the game to build different SNP chips and gene expression arrays and all these things that can monitor the, the biology of cannabis in ways that we could never do before. Uh, and all of that started really from Dash just snowballing a tiny little maybe $50,000 grant uh, that got a, an exceptional reference published. Uh, and now we have a springboard for, you know, you know, 10 other companies to launch off from and, uh, and build more tools that can help, uh, you know, improve yield or understand the, the biochemistry of the plant. So uh, that wasn't here a year ago. And so in the blink of a, of a year, uh, we've had a complete transformation of the field. And that's going to, it's going to lead to, I don't even know where it's going to lead. It's, it's, it's like, this happened on the human genome back in 2001. And it turned into, I've seen estimates that that, that genome project had stimulated over like $200 billion worth of economic input in the, in, in the 10 years to follow. Um, I think it's going to be bigger in cannabis wow. because you're seeing this in pain. Pain's like an $800 billion annual market globally. And then when you, when you hear about it in cancer and then in Alzheimer's and in epilepsy, and the list just goes on and on and on to all the areas that this has an impact. I, I think this is one of the larger transformational events happening in the economy right now. Yeah, and it'd be cool if that stayed open source and, and, and to the public so that you know, anyone could work with these cannabinoids to re relieve pain without having to go to a single monopoly of someone yeah, that owns. The I hope so too. And, and unfortunately, there, there is patenting going on and I don't blame people when it happens. I understand the, the dynamics there of getting funded and everything else. But, but the, good, the good news is with what Dash has done is it, is, is it pushes back on that. It, put, it puts, yeah. puts some boundaries around how broad those things can be. Yeah, so good, so good. It's really, really awesome, and uh, and I really applaud the work you've been doing, and applaud the Dash community for funding it. It's fantastic. Well, I'm just wondering, do you think that there's going to be other cryptos that get involved uh, in the same way that Dash has? Like, what made Dash so different that they wanted to do it? I mean, they had a wonderful so governance system, and they voted for it, and they've been legendary in terms of supporting cool stuff overall. The Dash community's been really amazing for a lot of reasons. But are there other cryptos that are involved? And if so, or why not? You know what I mean? So I, I've seen a couple of others. Um, I think like Podcoin is one of them and Hempcoin. And uh, I'm not as familiar with, with their, um, their blockchains. Uh, the, the, I've spent a lot of time studying Dash because I had to figure out how to apply for it. And I've got a good sense of, uh, I think, the architecture of it. And I think you're right. The treasury thing is really important. But they wanted to fund this, I, from what I read on a lot of the, the reviews of the grant proposal, is because they believe Dash is perfectly fit for dispensaries. The, the problem they're having in dispensaries is Bitcoin's 10-minute block cycle doesn't work. Uh, you know, they need to push people through those lines, you know, 15 seconds per customer if they can. They can't sit there and wait for a transaction to go uh, over Bitcoin. And the average transaction dispensary, this is like 80 to $100. So you're kind of, you're not really in that coffee range of like, let's just trust that, the, that it confirms, you know, it's, it's, it's enough money where people want confirmation uh, before they hand over the goods. Uh, yeah. so, so Dash has a good shot at solving that problem in, in the dispensary space. Um, and, uh, and they can get the, they can get the point of sale going. 
Uh, the other things that became apparent to them through, I think, this process is that there is an, an enormous seed to sale tracking problem going on in all the states, and Dash blockchain could be perfectly suited for that. Uh, for those who don't know, in cannabis, the laws are so outrageous that you have to track from seed to sale. You have to have barcodes, like like making sure everything makes its way through the pipeline in the taxed system because the taxes are like 30%. So there's a huge incentive for people to uh, to basically go outside of that system. The, the, the diversion incentive is directly related to high taxes, right? They're not going to change the high taxes. They're just rolling in money. Uh, and this is the political reason why it's happening in so many states. So we're always going to probably have really high taxes and a high incentive to divert. Now, the way they're trying to do seed and sale tracking is they're tying barcodes to the plants, which is it's kind of like Fred Flintstone's Stone Age tracking, right? Like you just take the plant, rip the barcode off, and you know, you're off. <laughs> Um, so when these plants get diverted, magically the barcodes disappear. Um, and so it's not a very good uh, track and trace system. Uh, and so where a lot of people are, are um, looking toward and have been asking us, like, can't you just do like some DNA fingerprinting thing on this? And that way, if it ever gets diverted, you know, you can, you can figure the, all that stuff out. And I'm, I'm not necessarily thrilled about that application because it sounds like it's going to be used to club people, but um, it is probably the right way to solve the problem. Uh, and Dash sees that as a, a, a way you, you can build a, a food chain or a blockchain uh, on uh, for cannabis, so you can actually replace those transactional engines with something that's less likely to get hacked. The problem we've had in the cannabis industry is that um, this Google MJ Freeway or a couple other of these companies, their their centralized databases that do the seed to sale tracking are routinely getting hacked, and when they get hacked, it shuts down the whole state because the state handed them a monopoly. They tend to do these RFAs like we need one company to come in and run one software service for the entire state. And if you fail, everyone goes down with you. Um, but that's what's happening. Like they've given a monopoly to metric for, for California. They gave a monopoly to MJ freeway for, I think for Washington and, and, and also Colorado. And then those things got hacked and that everyone had to go back to paper, uh, to paper trailing these things in those industries. So I think dash sees there's continuity from point of sale to maybe tracking uh, and to maybe even doing some of the peer review work that we did on, on their chain. Uh, because the, the peer review in the industry is a little bit uh, filtered as well. It's hard to get cannabis papers published because uh, a lot of people, a lot of editors still are stuck in that stigma of ivory tower uh, snobbery and they won't let it go through and they reject papers. And so you end up spending more time trying to get papers through peer review in the cannabis field than you probably do in others. Uh, and what we did with Dash on this cannabis genome is we actually, um, uh, we did the whole peer review process with the cryptocurrency incentivization system. Instead of uh, doing the typical peer review, uh, we basically put out bounties for people to come and review the work publicly and online and, and hashed everything so no one could, no one could um, you know, edit or mess with the, with the peer review. So there's a continuity there, I think, from point of sale all the way to even doing some of the science that could be done on, on blockchains like this. And Dash just struck me as one that has, um, I know everyone gives them a lot of crap as being some type of shitcoin, but I don't see that at all. I've never seen, uh, never in history have we had one currency rule them all. I mean, when has that happened? <laughs> is there is there a time where it was all gold everywhere all over the world i don't think that's the case i think when gold was probably popular in many other communities they probably had you know salts or or these these shells or, or the stones the rye stones i don't you know, the, the history of monetary currency at least in human history i don't think it's ever distilled down to a single coin due to culture no it's and the same with language it's, uh, there's many exactly. languages never yeah. Yeah, people have tried to do the unified language of Esperanto, but it just doesn't work. People want to have different things. And I, um, you know, as many people call me a Bitcoin maximalist because I'm always on Bitcoin and I love Bitcoin and I, and I do hope uh, and I, I put a lot of resources into developing uh, on that protocol, including Lightning Network and stuff. But I totally agree. When I, walk, when I go around the world and I go to different conferences, if I go to Malaysia, for instance, Dash is, uh, sorry, Litecoin is really interesting there. People are more and more obsessed about Litecoin in that region of the world. You go to Venezuela, Dash has been doing a lot of work there and, and in South America in general. And so I see a lot of work there, but I, 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 there's also online regions of the internet where certain coins are just more accepted. And, I, and uh, yeah, I don't like this sort of all encompassing term of shit coin because yeah, of course there are shit coins out there. There's terrible coins. I mean, I would put maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't, who knows, some of these coins that are just a name and uh, yeah. like, the, yeah, uh, cinema coin. This one's for cinemas. So, you know, <laughs> that's a <Yeah>. shit. <laughs> but, 
uh, you know, specific coins that are that are actually working, got development, got people committing to the GitHub, uh, doing something different. You know, I love the the whole governance system of, of Dash and being able to um, you know pay for for services and interesting projects like yourselves, and they, they also sponsored some of the stuff that Voltura is doing here, and so. I, I just think it's fantastic. So yeah, this whole notion that there's one coin to rule them all—I I don't really don't buy it. And I, the thing is, it doesn't really matter what I think the, the, or what you think. It's it's it, the the market will decide. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'd say I'm a Bitcoin mostmalist, not a maximalist. <laughs> That's and a nice way to put it. Most of my focus is there because I do think it has the network effect and a lot of those things you hear Trace Mayer talk about. But um, but there's certain things that just doesn't do well yet. And maybe it will eventually, but privacy is one, and and this whole you know governance thing I think is really key, and speed is really key, and and you're now playing around with equities too, which is very interesting, in terms of, of placing value on a coin. If they can actually invest those treasury funds into equity from startups, well, then we have a completely different um, model for uh, for how you value coins. It's not just about the transaction velocity and the, the number of users on it, but it's also about well what what else is backing that coin? If it gets backed by a basket of equities, then it starts to have almost a little bit of a Libra feel, even though that's kind of a dirty word these days. But um, uh, it's just different. And I think that is a worthwhile ex experimentation. And, and in science, mm. uh, we kind of encourage lots of experiments to be done and some of them fail and some of them don't. And you learn from that. Yeah, experiments without gulags. Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, people are definitely, I think, getting an education, but if they want more of one and they want to go to Canamed, can you give us some information on that? Is this something that a regular person can go to or do you have to be a doctor? No, anyone can go. Um, so there is, uh, Canamed is in Pasadena, September 23rd to 24th. Um, and there is a CME course if you are uh, in, in the medical field and you want to get uh, continuing medical ed education credits. I think that's the day before, though. I think it's on the 22nd. Um, so uh, it's, it, it spans everything from agricultural technology to genomics to cannabinoid medicine to analytical chemistry for, for making sure you can quantitate these things properly in plant samples. So it's, it's a big, broad spectrum. Anyone can go. Even There's even a breeder's rights and IP um, session that we're holding there just to try and address some of these questions about what do people do with plant patents and utility patents and open source approaches. Um, Christian Saucier is actually gonna join us from, he's done some work um, at uh, ripe.io, which is a food chain company. And we think what they did there is very analogous, can, can be applied to, to the, the cannabis space. So anyway, it, it encompasses some crypto as well. So uh, it's a really broad spectrum um, uh, conference and uh, you can go to canmedevents.com if you wanna learn more. There's some videos up there that might entice you. Awesome. So cool. Thanks so much, Kevin, for coming on. Uh, Josh, any final words before we take off for the day? No, I mean, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, I'm constantly tweeting about all things uh, crypto and precious metals. And uh, you can also trade crypto and precious metals on Voltor. Excellent. And if you guys are liking this show, share it with your friends, thetatianashow.com. We normally put out shows on Tuesdays, sometimes on Thursdays. And if you're in the mood for something a little different, check out my other podcast, Proof of Love. Uh, proofoflovecast.com is the website. And it's a relationship podcast for the crypto space. So it could be something a little bit, you know, you can't always listen to politics and crypto. So uh, thanks, everyone, for <laughs> tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. This episode of The Tatiana Show is brought to you by Voltoro. Voltoro is a gold hedging solution for the crypto community. One of the challenges of investing in cryptocurrencies is dealing with volatility. Keeping a diversified portfolio is a key to healthy returns. I keep about 10% of my crypto assets in gold using Voltoro. Voltoro allows me to open a gold wallet in seconds where I can easily trade with cryptos and gold. What I like about using Voltoro instead of Tether is that the gold in my Voltoro wallet is insured, audited, vaulted in Switzerland, and unlike fiat money, Gold has increased in value for the last 20 years. Visit voltoro.gold slash Tatiana today and get zero trading fees for the first three months. That is vault, like a gold vault, and oro, which is Spanish for gold. Voltoro, ole! Hey there, it's time for the show. The Tatiana Show. Where you make friends and talk life. And crypto, we got to think and reflect 
and use lots of intellect with our hearts when we work together. I know that it can be so hard out there, looking all around and saying that life ain't fair. So that is why we will fight and stay up late at night, listening to the Tatiana Show. What's the point of all this technology without a little love in our lives? Our hosts, Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz have come together to bring you Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. Thank you for listening to The Tatiana Show. Please follow us on Twitter at Queen Tatiana or on Facebook and Instagram at Tatiana Moroz Music. More episodes can be found at thetatianashow.com and make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. The Tatiana Show has been brought to you by CryptoMediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond.